Chicago doing tonight? <laughs> Emeril Lagasse here, folks. Got a great show for you all. Tonight we're traveling to a place where thyme and rosemary, sage and lavender grow wild along the hillsides. Hmm. <laughs> Just smell it now. And it's where people still make their own olive oil and their own wine. I'm talking about a beautiful region in France called Provence. Yeah, yeah baby. Yeah. You know, Provençal cuisine is known for its vibrant colors, enveloping perfumes, luscious ripe flavors. Doesn't that sound exciting, brother? Huh? So tonight we're going to cook up an incredible light fish soup with summer vegetable and rui, and then a lemon and lavender ice cream that's going to knock your socks off, guaranteed. Get ready to dine French provincial style right here on Emerald Live. everybody. All right. How you doing, Doc? How you feeling tonight? Doing outstanding. How are you? Good. Great. You don't mind if I squeeze by here, huh? <laughs> Sorry. It's a high rent area, you know? <laughs> Actually, I wanted to come and uh, wanted to focus in on one of our magical little tables here because um, there's some incredible ingredients that come from Provence. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to, uh, to go there a few times and also to, uh, to meet some wonderful people. They're very passionate about their food, but very passionate about simplicity. And uh, there was a current uh, food, uh, Bon Appetit magazine that just did a big story on ingredients of Provence. And, and uh, when you really think about it, the simplicity of ingredients really uh, trickles into their food. And one of uh, my favorite areas of France and its cuisine. It's very close to Italy. So there's a lot of influences of certain Italian, uh, like a little bit of pasta and some of the ingredients from Italy. But it really truly has its own magic, particularly because of the sea being there. So a lot of bouillabaises and stews and fish stews and lots of great fish uh, come from that area. Um, you'll drive down in the summertime particularly and smell this incredible aroma in the air and um, these beautiful vibrant purple colors along the roadside which is lavender and we don't use a lot of lavender in this country uh, we try to use it a lot at at the restaurant but it's a really really wonderful um, ingredient to flavor things from bread doughs and all kinds of things that you can do with it but lots of sunflowers come from that area lots of nuts lots of lemons and lots of produce beside fish and the simplistic uh, preparations of eggplant or artichokes uh, a lot of fennel, tomatoes, garlic, which is another reason why I love Provence. Have you ever been to Provence? No. Well, you are tonight. I guarantee you that. When we come back, we're going to take it to Provence, and then we're going to make a little vin the orange or orange wine. Stick around. We'll be right back. Doc Gibbs. song we got coming out by the Doxter Man and Cliff called Rhoda's Groove. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're celebrating tonight doing a little food from Provence, and that would be Provence, France. And I don't know why. I asked myself that just when I came down. I said, why? 
Why aren't you here with us? Because we're live in Chicago. One of the amazing things that you'll find when you go into a lot of the restaurants or a lot of the inns over in Provence is you'll see these enormous kind of glass jars. Sometimes they're in jugs that are generally on the bars or in the hallways or entranceways there of uh, fruit wines. And one of them particularly that's very popular is called the uh, orange wine or uh, in France uh, used a lot as sort of a festival punch or to get one festive with this particular <laughs> vin de orange is what it's called. Actually, I have to fess up, you know, because I'm the one that's kind of been sort of, well, I won't go there, but with the crew. <laughs> but basically, you know, when we came here, we have, uh, a lot of the crew's been here for a couple of weeks now, and uh, the heart and soul of it, uh, we've been trying to find the best here in Chicago. You guys really have a beautiful city, one of the best food cities in the world for that matter, not only just in the country, but also the people here are really, really nice. And uh, we, uh, we have been on, yes indeed. Some of you might have noticed that, uh, you know, uh, at night after, you know, doing shows and a lot of work, and stuff that a lot of the crew and, uh, and I, we, you know, we're on the search for that perfect virgin, Margarita. And um, we, each one of these represent one, by the way. And, um, but I have to, like, tail on the crew right now because last night we kicked it up a few notches and uh, it was one of those... <laughs> Actually... I gotta really fess up while with this Vin the Orange because we just haven't had a chance to get another cup yet. Doc turned in his <laughs> from when... <laughs> Doc and Gray, I should say. Gray's up there in the control tower, but we won't go there right now. But we've, uh, they're kind of festive. Anyhow, we're back in Provence here, and I want to just kind of show you this orange wine that you can make very, very simple, and it's very, very refreshing. First of all, you take good three juice oranges like this. Very, very small amount of water. I'm talking about a quarter of a cup, just so that as the heat begins, we're not going to burn these oranges up. And we're actually, what we're going to do is squeeze as much of the juice as we possibly can into the pot. That's why you need good juice oranges to get in there. I got it all over me already, but these are really good and juicy. And um, that's the first step of what we're going to do to make this orange wine. We'll squeeze all of that in there. And then, one of the main things that this does is it lasts a long time because it sort of goes through like a little fermentation, if you will, which is natural. Oh, yes. Love that. <laughs> Feeling healthy already, Hilda. <laughs> like a little vitamin C, Doc. Nothing like it, man. So we get a little bit of the juice of the orange right there, and then basically that, what we then do is we sweeten it with some sugar and uh, sort of make an orange simple, uh, simple syrup, syrup, if you will. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to crank the heat up a little bit and uh, let that sugar just sort of dissolve, which is why we're heating it up. Then the next thing that you need from that point on, beside a great bottle with a nice cork or you can... Use something as simple as a mason jar. We got some more oranges, which I'm going to show you a little technique about flavoring this. And then, of course, you need some good wine. Not no expensive, expensive wine. A good table wine uh, will, will work just fine. And that's exactly what we have here is we have a little Blanc de Blanc uh, wine from France. Now, some people that you'll talk to will argue with you that you should have brandy in this. Some places put brandy in with the wine and uh, kind of use it more as a... Well, I'm not say, saying that that's wrong, but it's really not pure or classical to have the brandy in it other than just the wine. Once you get all of this done and it gets dissolved and we bring that up to temperature and the sugar's dissolved, the next thing that you want to do is you want to strain this. You want to strain this liquid, if you will, this orange sugared liquid, 
And you want to really be able to squeeze all of the great flavor and the juice and the sugar that's in those oranges that are left in there. And that's exactly what I've done right here. It's exactly what I've done. We want to get those and we want to strain them. And uh, what the next thing that we want to do is we want to take that great juice that we, you see how thick it gets when you let it sit a little bit? You want to squeeze all of the oranges and get all of that flavor in there as the one that I did. And then the next thing that you want to do is this. The way to flavor this is to cut an orange, another orange, not the ones that you already steeped up. Reason for that is is because it will get a little bit bitter if you use these oranges because we've applied heat to them. Then what you do is that you stud the bottom of these oranges with some cloves. Now, if you don't like cloves, and some people don't use cloves. This is one of those argument things, again, who uses cloves, who doesn't use cloves. We're going to use a few cloves like this. Like our friend Annie uh, at Peristyles in New Orleans, she doesn't, she doesn't use cloves in her oranges. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to stick them in the bottom, and we'll do that a couple of times. Then the juice goes in, which is why it's called orange wine, and then it's also topped off with some of the wine. All right, a lot of the wine. <laughs> so we probably have room for one more orange in there. And now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, just sort of bottle this or jar this or can it, and you let this ferment. Some of them let this ferment for at least, at least, a month before they start to drink it. And like I said, it gets everybody in the festive mode, a little vin de orange. Now, when we come back, I've got a dear, dear friend over there, one of the world's greatest chefs. His name is Roger, Roger Verger. Roger Verger, great, great chef. We're going to do a little dish inspired by Mr. Verger out of his book, and then we're going to kick it up another notch. Stick around. We'll be right back, folks. <laughs> Like we say in the kitchen, excellent. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we move on to a little inspiration by my dear friend, wonderful chef, Mr. Verger, first thing that we're going to do is we've had this one, I guess it's, this has been about, what, three weeks, huh? A little over three weeks that we did this. So we'll check it out. <laughs> like peanuts, popcorn, all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, baby. You can smell it, huh, Trey? Yeah, huh? You know what I say when I open that up, buddy? Bam! Just like that. All right, we're going to check this out. I don't know how powerful this is. Probably, uh... Might have to cancel the show. <laughs> when in doubt, Doc can always come and cook. <laughs> How you doing, Doc? All right. Got your man. eye on this orange wine, don't you? Oh man, it looks pretty good. It smells really good. It's it's not you know it's really good and fermented, but it's not uh, it's not off the page. Let's check it out here. We're gonna let our guests. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Where are you guys from? Chicago. Great. All right. All right. Well, see, I got to ask that because in New York, when we say, where are you from? They don't say New York. They go, New Jersey. <laughs> All right. That's a good thing. Thank you. Here's to Wisconsin. 
Isn't that delicious? Really, really refreshing. Anyhow, there's the orange wine. You keep it back in the refrigerator. Except I'll leave this one out because I know where Doc's going next. So, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we're going to move on. Now, you know, a lot of people think this next dish, which is a dish and an inspiration from my really dear friend, Mr. Roger Verger, in his book, Entertaining in the French Style. If you can ever find that book, it's worth the investment. Incredible, incredible book on Provence cooking. And this is one of those simple dishes that I wanted to do out of Mr. Verger's book for you, which everybody thinks is Swiss. Now, it is Swiss, but the term is really French. And uh, do you guys know what that term may be, what I'm, where I'm going with this thing? Should we tell them, Felicia? What are we doing? Okay, fondue. <laughs> Why I'm saying that? It's, not, it's a French term, fondue, which means melting, but the dish is really an inspiration from the Swiss right across the border. Here's Mr. Verger's fondue that you could do at home. You know, they're popular again. They're back. There are restaurants now around, uh, not only in Chicago, here around the country. Fondues are making their way back onto the menus. It's unbelievable. Watch how simple this is. We start with a dry white wine first in the bottom of this little pot. And then Mr. Verger fuses that wine with a clove of garlic. No wonder why I like it. <laughs> and uh, you bring that up to temperature a little bit, sort of let that get really good and hot, and really just kind of, don't let it simmer, but just kind of let it, let it cook a little bit, and let that garlic flavor just sort of fuse that wine. Then the other ingredients. He uses goat cheese. Goat cheese is very, very, very popular uh, in Provence, made either from goat's milk and or sheep's milk, really, chev can, uh, can be made from. We've got a little combination of some of those beautiful French chevs right here. See how pearly white that is? No dark spots on it right here. Really, really wonderful flavor. These are right from Provence that, we, uh, that we've got from the excellent, incredible team here at the Food Network. Really great flavor. So we're going to uh, use some of those. Actually, I like this goat cheese just on a little crusty bread like this would work for me. All right, then the other cheese, being the uh, Swiss side, is Gruyere cheese, which is a Swiss cheese, uh, a little bit aged, that we've grated. So we've got two different cheeses. We've got that wonderful texture that we're going to get from the chev, and then also that wonderful flavor and the sharpness from the, from the Gruyere cheese. This is how you can buy Gruyere in chunks like that, and then just with a hand grater, you can just kind of grate it like I did right here. Then, a little bit of thyme. Thyme grows wild in Provence, and they use a lot of thyme in the cooking there, both with fish, different meats, and what we're going to do is we're just going to add a little bit of that thyme. We don't want it to overpower the cheese, but it gives a nice flavor. Then, a little bit of white pepper for the spice, for the spiciness, and then a tiny, tiny bit of Dijon mustard goes in there as well. A little bit of Dijon mustard, which I've never really heard of except for Mr. Verger with and in fondues, but it really has a delicious flavor. Now, once that ingredients flavor that wine a little bit, you can either strain it or what you can do is just remove the garlic clove. Since I love garlic, I'm leaving my clove in, okay? Now, The other interesting ingredient, the other interesting ingredient is this uh, particular wine that Mr. Verger uses in this fondue called Mock, it's like M-A-R-C, Mock de Bourguignon. And um, it's really, really got this very, very unique sort of smell and flavor. It, it's kind of between a liqueur and a wine. And it has um, sort of almost like a little bit of like bitters does, like a little bit of that aromatic smell but really, really tasty. We're going to use a little bit of that mock de Bourguignon in that. We may add more. <laughs> also, a little bit of butter is melted and used inside of that liquid. And then once that butter gets liquid in there, we're basically ready to start the fondue. What we've done while that's happening is uh, generally what it is is country bread, which is very, very popular uh, in Provence. We slice some country bread. You could, there's a lot of great bakeries here in Chicago that you can get that from, and we kind of just lightly toasting that. 
because fondue is generally dipped, or what's dipped in fondue is toasted bread or toasted cr uh, crusty bread. That's traditionally what is used in fondue. These days, they got berries, they got all kinds of things that they put in them. Basically, it's crusty bread. Can you smell that? Doesn't that smell? You should have smell-o-vision at home. You should call your cable okay. operator right now and complain. That's what I would do, that they don't have smell-o-vision. So, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to start adding the goat cheese, and it'll stop breaking down, and you can use also a little bit of your whisk like this and breaking that cheese down to get the consistency. And also, we're going to start adding a little bit of the Gruyere cheese as well in there to get the sharpness until we get that consistency. What the consistency should be like? Well, it's kind of a common sense thing. I mean, you don't want it where you can't basically... If you ever get to the point when you're doing this and you can't move your arm anymore, okay, like your arm is stuck in the cheese, that would be a good indication that it's too thick for those of you, you know. Now, also, if you could, like, drink it, like, you see how loose it is right there, that would be a good indication that it's too thin. So what happens is that cheese is a natural thickening agent, and so you just keep adding the cheese like this until you get... I would estimate that this is going to be about three cups of cheese. It'd be about three cups, three and a half cups of cheese to get the right consistency. Now, the other thing is once your cheese begins to stop melding, just like mine is doing right now, that's when you have to serve it with that crusty bread. And also, the other thing that you want to remember is that you want to turn the heat off. Once the cheese is just about melted, you want to turn the heat off. So I'm going to keep whisking that cheese in. Over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some good provincial olive oil from France in a little skillet. And I've got onions and I've got some fennel, which I'm going to start cooking in this olive oil and, uh, and also start finishing right here this wonderful, wonderful dish right here inspired by Mr. Verger. This would be a good time for you right now to go do what you, know, you got to do, one of them frozen things or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Because when we come up, we're going to finish this wonderful fondue by Mr. Verger, and then we're going to make a killer, and I mean killer, fish soup. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Emerald Lagasse here. We're live in Chicago having a ball, aren't we, guys? Huh? Yeah. Well, we've about got all that cheese mixed in there for our incredible inspired fondue by my dear friend, Mr. Roger Verger, and his uh, awesome book, Remember, Entertaining in the French Style by Roger Verger. If you can get your hands on that, you want to talk about incredible book about Provence and the man himself. 1969 is when he uh, really came out to shoot and gained three Michelin stars. Amazing. Also, I'm doing another provincial dish over here. I started with onions and fennel that were sliced, salt and pepper, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute and show you this. Let's, uh, let's check on our crusty bread for our fondue. I had a double, uh, double wide over here, you know what I'm saying, Cliff? I like the double wide. Oh, yeah, baby. That's my plate right there. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> because now we can eliminate this one. Now I can show you all about this incredible. We're going to whisk it in one more time. Be careful it doesn't get on you. Cheese, it will burn. And um, it's nice and smooth, but yet, look, it's got the, that texture of that Gruyere cheese as well. You see that? Here's, uh, here's how you would do it. Get a little dish like this. If you don't have a, a, um, 
you know, one of those special fondue pots, what you can do is just use a little dish like this, and you can always go back for a little more. And then um, basically, you know, they got those big fancy forks and all that stuff, you know, those long things. They just fight with them. I don't know why they hand them out, but. <laughs> and just tear a little bread like this. And then um, basically what you do is you can just dip it right inside there, ladies, like this. You see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of let it rip from there, and you kind of turn it around. I'll let you be the first guinea pig. <laughs> Lay that on you right there, ladies. Oh let me know God. if you need some more bread. Oh Help God. yourself. <laughs> There's the little fondue for Mr. Verger. Me to you. Good, huh? All right. We'll get a, uh, we'll get a little bit more of that uh, fondue by Mr. Verger out in the audience here in a second. But first, why I started doing these onions and fennel, ladies and gentlemen, is because two magical ingredients, yet very simple in Provence. Because one of the things that Provence is known for, even though that it sort of uh, originated in Marseille, France, is it's really the capital for bouillabaisse. And because of the ocean being right there of the cliffs and right smack there, it, wonderful fish of the day kind of makes up these in various types of restaurants when you're there. Generally, rockfish will be in most of the bouillabaisse that you'll eat. But then, here's a couple of other things that they do, which... It's just absolutely, why I'm doing it for you, it's absolutely a food of love thing. Artichokes, particularly baby artichokes, are very, very popular there in a lot of what they eat and what they do, and in salads and all kinds of things. And so I took some of these artichokes, and I wanted to show you that when you find them this small like that, there's a couple of different things that you can do. You can cut them in half, or you can quarter them like this, you see, and then... What you generally want to do, folks, is you generally want to take a little bowl like I have right here of water, and you want to squeeze the juice of a lemon or two inside of this bowl. And that's what's going to keep the, like potatoes, if you don't put potatoes in water, they turn brown on you, right? Same thing with artichokes. If you don't put a little acid on them, either vinegar or lemon, what's going to happen is that they'll begin to start turning brown on you. In uh, France, what they use is a very unique technique called a blanc. And that is, is that they'll put and pass flour through a sieve, and the enzymes and particles inside of the flour actually keep the artichokes white. In this country here, we generally use lemon. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to add our hard vegetables next, which are these wonderful artichokes, now that the onions and fennel have sort of cooked. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add another layer of seasoning. We're going to add a little more salt to those artichokes and some pepper. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add another hard vegetable because, you know, artichokes are going to take a little bit of time, and that is some of these potatoes. We're going to add some potatoes. Then, the next ingredient that we're going to use, which is predominant in Provence in their fish stews and in their bouillabaisse's, is they like to use a little bit of orange peel. They use a tiny bit of orange peel in their stock preparations for a wonderful little flavor. So we're going to use some grated orange peel, and then I have some fish stock. Don't be alarmed. If you don't have fish stock, you can use water. Fish stock is very, very simple to make. We're going to just cover this here with a nice fish stock. Somebody uh, in the back said, can you use clam juice? I guess you can. I never have, but I guess you can. I, I wouldn't see why not. What we want to do now is we're going to press these, but we've got to cook and steam these artichokes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add these uh, to the, the lid to the top of this right here so that the artichokes and the potatoes can begin to cook. Then what we're going to do from there is we're going to come back. There's some beautiful Swiss chard that they add, beautiful tomatoes that they have, and I'm going to show you how to make a classic Rui to go with this. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Hey, give it up, Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. All right, welcome back. If you just fell off another planet, we're live in Chicago right here. About 15 minutes when those artichokes and the potatoes start getting fork tender, as they are right here. And that wonderful orange flavor has just sort of come out now with the fennel and the onions. Now it's time to kick it up a couple of notches. Now, the next ingredient, Swiss chard. That's what I have in front of me right here. Used a lot in Provence. We're gonna add that. Really high in vitamins and minerals and stuff. And then of course, tomatoes, which are also used in a lot of provincial cooking. Why we're doing that right now, in New Orleans we have a dish like that that's called Kubion. Why we're doing that now is because we're adding another layer of flavors. We're adding a little more salt and we're adding some fresh cracked pepper. Because basically now we're just going to get that, just get those flavors of the shod and the tomatoes in there before we add the fish or you could add mussels or you could add clams or shrimp or whatever. Traditionally what's used is just the freshest fish cut in pieces like that. That's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to let that come back, then we're going to add the fish. When we add the fish in there, basically four or five minutes, it's a done deal. Now, classically what's served with this in Provence is called a rui. Big fancy word for I'm going to show you right now. They roast the pepper, skin the pepper, and they add the pepper in there. A couple of cloves of garlic. Oh, yeah, babe. Some Dijon mustard. And then we'll add an egg which will be the emulsifier for this. We'll add the juice. We'll add the juice of a lemon like this. Then, a little bit of parsley. Then what happens is this, is we start to emulsify this. What do I mean? I take good olive oil like this, and start slowly drizzling this in there. Rui, it's a red pepper mayonnaise, is basically what that is. We're gonna season it with salt and pepper. And then what they do right at the end, they use a little bit of bread. They use a little bread in the Rui in Provence, a lot in France, to just give it a little more texture and a little bit more flavor. What they'll do is in this brothy fish stew, if you will, they'll drizzle some of this on the top of the soup like that, you see? See what I got right here? That's it right there. Red pepper mayonnaise, that's the Rui for this. Little salt, pepper, yum, yum. Ah, I like it on crackers. Now, another magical ingredient that I love personally, and that's everywhere, this is lavender. And lavender is what is along the uh, countryside, along the roads, bright, bright, bright purple color. This is dry lavender. This is what it looks like right here when you take it off the stem and it has this incredible flavor. Here's what we're gonna do. Little milk, little cream in the saucepan, little bit of lavender. Steep it up. Get all that flavor out of the lavender. That's what I have right here. Then, when you let it cool just a little bit, you strain it. So you're not chewing like on, you know, lavender seeds, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but you got all of the flavor. You got all the flavor of the lavender. Then, you take some egg and egg yolks, sugar, Mix that in together because what we're going to do is we're going to make an ice cream base, okay? A lavender ice cream. You want to talk about good. Let me tell you, those guys in uh, Vermont or wherever they are, they ain't seen nothing yet. You temper the eggs and the sugar like this, and then this is the lavender ice cream base that's ready to go inside of an ice cream cylinder. Oh, you know, the manufacturer suggested time, whatever you got, or you can do it the old-fashioned way, if you know what I'm saying. Or what you can do is just go to Michigan Avenue and ask one of those cows you're all good. I'm sure they'll know. <laughs> when we come back, we're gonna finish our incredible ice cream and his fish stew. Stick around, we'll be right back. Hey, hey. 
Hey, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. You know, I was uh, while we were on the break, I was looking at the, uh, the some of our emails that come around, and then I discovered that I had an old picture of Jay, our cameraman, and uh, in his younger days. But uh, now he's fit and trim, and you know all that stuff. And anyhow, we won't go there right now. You know, we love you, Jay. Anyhow, so I added the fish, added the fish in there, and uh, now we're slowly setting, uh, letting that simmer. If you let it boil, it's going to totally break up the fish and you're going to have a mess. So you just want it to simmer. Meanwhile, I got some butter and sugar in here. You know I love you, Jay. And uh, we... All right, I won't tell them that I love you. I got some butter and sugar, and we're letting it kind of get pale because we're going to make some awesome almond cookies to go with that lavender ice cream. Now, once that creams together, we're going to add some egg yolks in here for the richness of that. A little bit of vanilla. Then, got a little bit of salt. And then what you do, once that's all mixed up together, we're then going to add our flour in here to make a cookie dough. That's when you want to be very, very careful. If you, you, know, you don't want to turn it on so high, it goes everywhere. You, Get the instant gray look, you know, like that. Just So you want to do it slow like that, and it forms a cookie dough. It's very, very easy to do now, these almond cookies. It's very, very easy once it forms into the dough. The best thing that I like to do is to take a piece of parchment paper, take all of your dough inside of here, whether it's chocolate chips or almond or whatever, and just kind of roll it up like that. That's what I got right here. You see, moms, dads, because then you can keep these easily inside of the ice box. Guys come home from school, from work, whatever, you want to have a few cookies, this is what you do. You just whack off a hunk like this, okay? Then basically what you can do is you just cut them like this here. Take the paper away, see? Put them on your sheet pan like this. Hey, you're ready to bake cookies. That's how easy it is. Now, one thing that you want to do is you want to dust your baking paper with a little bit of uh, flour like this. Then you set the cookies down, and then you easily just put some almonds like this. You bake them for about 18 to 20 minutes, and basically what happens is that's what you have in 18 to 20 minutes. You got very simple, delicious almond cookies, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Now, watch this. Our fish stew, ladies, is ready. Here's how I would serve it. I would serve that wonderful broth with that fish and the potatoes and the artichokes that are just busting with flavor right now. Am I playing with your emotions? <laughs> See the potatoes and the artichokes like this, just unbelievable. See that? Then what they would do, beside that, in Provence, what they would do is they would serve some toasted bread a little bit off to the side like this so that you can do your rui. Or what they would do for you is take the rui on the crouton and they would kind of float it like this so that you can eat this rui with your fish stew just like this. You see that? And then they would actually just a little bit of garnish. Then, of course, if they knew that we were over here, I would go bam, just like that. <laughs> kind of kick it up a couple of notches like that. There you have a little bullet base. Thank you. Ooh. Okay. Now, make some friends. All right, here's what we do. That recommended manufacturer's, you know what I'm talking about, cylinder thing when you make an ice cream. God bless them all. Here's what I would do for you, folks. I would get some of that wonderful lavender ice cream that we made, and I would put in a little glass like this at least one scoop, if not two scoops, of lavender ice cream, just like that. Then... <laughs> It's a food of love thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> then what I would do is put at least one of those almond cookies off to the side. You can garnish it with some lavender petals like this, maybe a little bit of, oh, you see, you're getting me all excited here now. <laughs> then if you really want to kick it up, you can serve a little bit of lavender garnish like this, or, hey, fool all the neighbors. They wouldn't even know what that is right there. <laughs> Just tell them it's one of those, well, don't go there anyhow like that. Have you ever had lavender ice cream, my friend? No. 
Here, come here, stand up for a minute, really. We won't embarrass you in front of 40 million people. <laughs> Just give it a little taste. Is that not good? Mm. Is that here? Now have a cookie. Yeah. I know you wanted one of those. You're eyeing over there. I got to give my friend Trey over here a little bite. Here you go, Trey. Check it out, buddy. A little almond cookie for you. Hey, what can I say? I'm Ember Lagasse. Thanks for joining me tonight. See you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs>